You're listening to the weekly sermon at Second Baptist Church in Cedartown, Georgia. Second Baptist Cedartown exists to worship God, disciple believers, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to be in Job chapter 38 this morning, Job chapter 38, and also Job 42. And as you're turning there, let me just mention again about Sunday nights. We have something for everybody in the family on Sunday nights. We have those adult classes that were mentioned. And we have uh, children's, uh, Children in Action. Uh, it's a class where kids learn about missions. We have youth on Sunday nights. And we are starting Trail Life USA on Sunday nights. So something for your boys. Uh, it's not starting next week, but in two weeks there's a parent meeting. Okay, Sunday afternoon in two weeks. You can see John Johnson about that. So good to be a part of a church family where there are multiple generations present. All under one roof. There's a lot of babies in here, praise the Lord. There's a lot of young folks, a lot of adults. There's a lot of old people, too. I'll let you define that, whatever that is. <laughs> but, man, it's so good to be a part of the family of God, to be a part of a multi-generational church. I think that's, that honors the Lord uh, because every, every generation matters. Your season of life, it matters, and uh, you can glorify God, maybe sometimes in a different way through different seasons, but... So thankful for all of you and, and thankful to be a part of a church where there are so many different generations present. Job chapter 38, and we're going to start in the first verse. If you've found your place, let's all stand out of respect to reading God's word this morning. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. If you would skip with me over to chapter 42, starting in verse 1. And Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? God, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word. I pray, God, that you would lead us today, that you would mold us and shape us more into the image of your son, who you would have us to be, Lord. As we are a part of this sanctification process, Lord, I pray that you would do what only you can do. That, Lord, you would change our hearts, that you would transform our minds, that you would help us to seek repentance, that we could experience restoration, reconciliation with you, Lord. It's only through the power of your word and through the power of your Holy Spirit that we have the hope of eternity, the hope for this life, Lord. And it's because of your presence that we can go forward trusting, believing doing whatever it is that you've called us to do. And we pray that you bless this time together, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. We're ending our study over the book of Job. We've been here for about three months, and there's so much in here. We obviously didn't cover every single chapter, but there are uh, the main themes that we covered. We started off this series focusing on the big picture of the story of Job. It could be Possibly the oldest book in the Bible. We don't really know. There are some who believe that. It's certainly a story that addresses age-old questions, age-old issues that people have dealt with from generation to generation. Big questions that oftentimes we don't always know the answer to. Questions of suffering and pain. Questions of how to respond in the valleys of life. Some are some very deep questions, some very weighty questions, because Job is in the midst of the most intense 
amount of suffering that he had ever experienced in his life. And it's a very weighty subject when you think about suffering, you think about pain, and you think about grief. But we need to, as Christians, have a right theology of grief, a right theology of pain and of suffering in this world, the issues that come our way. Because so often uh, we are tempted to think that since we're believers, we just don't have to worry about anything. Nothing's going to come our way and nothing's going to hurt us. But the truth of the matter is when you try to do what the Lord has called you to do, Satan ramps up his efforts against you. And I would not be surprised... If you are doing what God has called you to do and you struggled in that. Because Satan does not want you to do what God has called you to do. You should not be surprised that there would be things that come your way. That there is adversity. That there are problems. That there are issues to happen when you try to do the right thing. And you try to do what God has called you to do. That's certainly some of what Job had experienced here. The overall point of the story points to the main theme of the Bible, though, and that is the theme of restoration. God has a big picture in mind that has been unfolding all throughout human history, thousands of years' worth of history, and God is at work bringing about restoration to mankind. Someone once told me in a very simple way, and I thought it was spot on, that the first couple of pages of the Bible is about God's relationship with man. And for the first couple of pages, things are really good. You know, they didn't have to work for the first couple of pages. I don't think Adam and Eve really fussed and followed a whole bunch for the first couple of pages. Not not from what I can read. But it doesn't take long for man to mess that up, does it? It really, Really, it's just a couple chapters in. So the first couple of pages are about... God's relationship with mankind, and the rest of the Bible is about God restoring that relationship with mankind. Through ups and downs, twists and turns, failures and successes, God is bringing about restoration to those who will trust in the gospel. And that's what the story is all about. The meta narrative, the big picture of the Bible, what God is doing is in the end, God will make all things right. And church, aren't you thankful for that? While, while things that we experience here on earth from time to time, it may feel like it will never end. The pain, the suffering, the difficulty, the adversity, whatever it may be. It may feel like there is no end in sight. But for the Christian, we have the hope of eternity. Knowing that in the end, God reigns supreme. In the end, all things will be made right. So here in Job 38, there's a discourse. And leading up to Job 38, there's a discourse that lasts several chapters in the book of Job. And you can read through it and you can understand it's basically saying a lot of the same thing for several chapters. Between Job and his friends, we've touched on that quite a bit because uh, his friends have a disagreement on why Job is experiencing the things that he is experiencing. Uh, There's a discourse between Job and his friends. Then there's a discourse between God and Job. God answers Job here in chapter 38 concerning the state of his mind, the state of his heart. And here, it is no doubt a wake-up call for Job. God doesn't mince any words, does he? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world, Job? And he says this, prepare yourself like a man. I'll question you and you will answer me. God is not cutting any corners or beating around the bush. He is getting straight to the heart of what Job is addressing. And I want to talk about this or as, a, as, a, as a preface to what we're going to preach on. When we talk about repentance and restoration, we talk about change that happens in our lives. We have to recognize this. We live in a world that promotes acceptance and tolerance at all costs. And it's funny, sometimes the people that preach tolerance, though, are sometimes the most intolerant of all. (laughs) When they think about if they're intolerant of your ideas or their ideas... But, but nonetheless, it's, it's lifted up as some sort of virtue in our society to preach tolerance and acceptance. That you accept everything and everyone the way that they are. In a world like that, we have to be reminded that this message of the gospel is a message of repentance and change. 
And while the world may preach a certain message and the foundations of the world and the ideologies of the world, they may shift and change from time to time. And that may be the virtue that the world embraces today. The foundations of Scripture never change. And the foundation of the Bible is this, that it is a message of repentance and change. The, the same message should be preached today that has been preached for thousands of years, starting with the old prophets of the Old Testament, the, the apostles of the New Testament, and that is this, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. We need to turn away from the world and turn towards the Lord. That's what repentance means. So there may be some who say in this day and age... Just be who you are and never change. The gospel is this. God created us. God loves us. God cares for us. He is willing to do uh, so much for us in that he sent Jesus to die on the cross of Calvary for our sins. He loves you, but he wants to see change happen in your lives for his glory. That's the gospel. The gospel isn't about affirming us. The gospel is about transforming us. It's literally taking who we are in our sinfulness and God loving us. And we read in scripture, he says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the midst of our sin, in the midst of our difficulty, God meets us there. But praise the Lord, he doesn't leave us there. Because it's a message of transformation, a message of restoration, a message of reconciliation. It's not affirming all the things of our lives. It is transforming who we are to be made more into the image of Christ. So my main point is this. If we want to see restoration in our lives, we have to be confronted with a few questions. And one is this. When we look at the whole totality of this story, we have to be confronted with really the same questions that Job himself was confronted with. And look at the context of Job chapter 38. God answered Job out of a whirlwind. He wanted to get Job's attention. I don't think it was a coincidence that it was out of a whirlwind because we read in uh, the beginning of the book of Job that Job lost his uh, sons and daughters by a mighty wind. So you see in the beginning of the story a wind, a tumultuous wind that brings in all of Job's pain and his difficulty and everything else. You see at the end of the story God showing up to address Job and he addresses him out of a whirlwind to get his attention. Sometimes God uses storms to show the significance of those particular occasions. We see other examples in Scripture. Exodus chapter 19, 1 Kings chapter 19, God shows up in a whirlwind. He shows up in the midst of a storm. Now, you may walk outside today, and it may not come up a physical storm in front of you for God to get your attention, but I still believe God uses storms. I still believe God uses sometimes the spiritual storms of your life. The emotional storms of your life, the financial storms of your life, the relational storms of your life. Sometimes God shows up in the middle of that to show you and to speak to you and to tell you exactly how you should respond in the midst of that. To point you back to his word, the foundation of truth that we have in scripture. So I don't think it's coincidence. And then, then God says this, prepare yourself like a man. Literally, in Hebrew, he says Gird up your loins like a man. And what that refers to is to prepare yourself, to get ready. As a warrior would, would wrap their loins around their legs to prepare for battle, to ready themselves for whatever was coming their way. The word for man here is the Hebrew word gabor. It's not the usual Hebrew word for man, Adam or Adam. Here, gabor means a hero, a champion, a strong man. It's a little bit of a different context. And so God is literally telling Job, he says, prepare yourself like the champion or the man or the hero that you think you are. <laughs> Get ready because I'm fixing to address this. It's interesting. When you read the chapters previous to chapter 38, Job had acted as if he was the plaintiff and God was the defendant. As if he was putting God on trial 
for what God had done. And at certain times you can read Job's uh, emotional understanding of this situation. But here it's obvious that God is not the defendant Job is. It's obvious that, that Job is the one who needs to defend his actions. The tables are turned here. So the first question I think we have to ask ourselves is the question that Job was presented with. Who am I? Who am I? God doesn't mince any words towards Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Now that's a tough question. It's not hard to understand, but it's hard for us to sit back and to think about our relation to a holy and a righteous God. Because God is asking Job with, with no, in no way beating around the bush, God is asking Job directly, who do you think that you are, Job? To ask these sort of questions, to question the the authority of God or the intentions or the motives of God. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? It's a rhetorical question. The obvious answer is, Job, you didn't exist. You weren't there, Job. And why was that? Because God created Job. And in the same way, God has created us. There's a great temptation today. To question God regarding the things in this world. And I'm going to be honest with you. This is a message I have to preach to myself. And the Lord has to meet with me in my study before I ever preach to anyone else. And it's a convicting message, I think, if you think about it. Because today we are tempted to question God regarding the things of this world. And I think part of that temptation is due to the fact we feel more in control of our lives than any other human generation throughout history. We have more control over the things that we uh, experience in this day and age. And let me give you a few examples of how we can control things or how we have an, an idea of control that, that other generations throughout human history just simply did not have. We live in an age of antibiotics and elective surgeries. We live in an age... Where if you get sick with something, there's probably medicine that will help you with that. Previous generations didn't always have that. We, we have a, a day and age where we can choose to have certain surgeries, whether or not we need them. And there are things that we have surgeries today, and it takes 15 minutes for that issue to be cleared up, that previous generations would die from. You recognize the difference here? We can do something about much of our circumstances today. Even medically, we can do things that previous generations throughout human history would never, ever be able to do. We live in the United States of America today. I still think it's the greatest country in the history of the world. We have a voice and a vote in the affairs of our government. Now, we can talk all day about whether or not they actually count that vote or whatever. <laughs> Look, we, we can talk about politics and everything else, but, but recognize this. This is still the United States of America. We do have a constitution. We do have freedom in this world. There is no government official that is coming in here to shut us down. It's not happening. It is happening in other churches around the world. There's pressure, no doubt. And, and that pressure is mounting. I think it's growing. And as Christians, we have a right and a responsibility to stand up for liberty in this world. I think it's right, and it is good for Christians to do that. Just as Paul advocated his Roman citizenship in defending and preaching the gospel, we advocate our American citizenship in defending and preaching the gospel in the same way. But recognize this, you live in a country, in a country that acknowledges those freedoms, that millions and billions of people that, that even exist today or previous generations throughout human history could only dream of. We can elect people to office. We can change people that are our leaders because we have that capability. We're the most mobile human society in the history of the world. 1980, 278 million people traveled as tourists in 1980. In 2019, 1.4 billion people throughout the world traveled as tourists. You can go to different places if you want to. You can hop on a plane and go around the world. You can hop in your car and you can go very far in this day and age. We also control our physical extremities, the, the places around us. I can go home and I can tell Alexa, I can say a sentence out loud and it will change the temperature of my home. 
I've said before, it's the only woman in my home that listens to me. We have machines that wash our clothes, dishes, and vacuum our floors. Machines that do all these things for us, and we just tell Alexa to do it. We have goods that travel to us cheaply from all corners of the world. We can communicate instantly via video with people from thousands of miles away. Could you imagine someone from Job's time, or even someone from Jesus' time, who, who, who was exposed to the capability of video chat with people around the world? Or you try to explain Facebook to them. Man, that'd be a difficult <laughs> concept to explain, or Twitter, or X, or whatever it is you call it. We live in a day and age where we have in our hands more power than any human has ever had in the history of the world. And here's the temptation, Christian. With that power, with that capability, you may be tempted or you may be fooled to think that you have some sort of godlike power. You may never use that word. But you may be fooled into thinking that, that you can control so much of your circumstances. Why is it that God would ever do this to me? That's not what I would do, God. We may be fooled by the relative power that we have in our society. We may begin to think this is the way that it will be. Or this is the way that it should always be. And we may be tempted to start to tell God how it should be. We control other things in our life. Why can't we control this? Charles Spurgeon said this, the holiest of Christians and those who understand best the gospel of Christ find in themselves a constant inclination to look to the power of the creature instead of looking to the power of God and the power of God alone. I think it's worth sharing and it's worth sharing in my own heart and reminding myself of this, that when I have to look at myself in the mirror and remind myself, I am not God. Christian, you are not God. There are still circumstances today that are beyond our control. There are still things that happen today that only God does. And he doesn't ask us what we think should happen in those circumstances. Because he's God and I'm not. Who am I? I'm his creation. Now... I believe this. God has created us with intentionality, with purpose, with love. And he has given us distinctives that honor and glorify him. We are created in his image. There is no doubt that God loves us, that, that we're his prized creation. But at the end of the day, we are not God. And he can choose to do anything and everything he wants to do. And it is his full right and authority to do so. He's God. Well, that's the question we have to ask. The second question I think Job was confronted with. Who is God? Who is God? Well, God's in control. He's the one in the driver's seat. He's the one that guides the affairs of men and nations. He allows us to have some freedom, some flexibility in things. We make decisions on a daily basis. And it is all because of a sovereign and a holy God. And can I tell you, there are, you go on a mission trip. And you go to another part of the world where they don't have control over their circumstances. Where they don't have control and everything is dependent sometimes on the crops. Whether or not the crops are going to rise up this year or not. That's the difference between starvation or between feasting that year. They're, they're totally dependent on other things or other people. They can't change or choose a certain path for themselves. And can I tell you, those are the people that realize their dependence on a holy and a sovereign God. They know that if it's not for God, they would never survive. And we have to remind ourselves of this today, that there is a God who still controls all things, who is still in control, who is still in charge. Y'all probably said the, the bumper sticker, or somebody has, has shared it before, that, that God is my co-pilot. Man, if God's your co-pilot, you need to move over. <laughs> that ain't the way it works. Right? You, you don't pilot nothing. <laughs> God is in the driver's seat, Christian. He's the one who, who leads us and guides us every day. L listen, I, I, was, I was watching a documentary not too long ago, and it was behind the scenes of the busiest airport in the world. And if you've been there, you know where it is. It's in Atlanta. It is busy. It was amazing, though, to see pictures behind the scene, videos behind the scene, or, you know, the Fully autonomous trains. The plane train is totally autonomous. I thought somebody drove the thing. <laughs> and apparently it's a computer. Uh, there's 
4,700 acres and five parallel runways at the Atlanta airport. August of 2023, they had 67,677 flights in one month. And it is amazing the, to see the capacity of human ingenuity to be able to control and to create all of these things. And they know exactly when planes are landing, when planes are leaving. They know exactly where they're going, what they're going to be doing. They have tens of thousands of bags that apparently they lose sometimes, but they keep control over from, from time to time, and they know where those bags are. All of these moving parts, these intricate details. And you know one thing they cannot control at the Atlanta airport? Birds. <laughs> they were talking about birds, that this is their biggest issue. They literally, listen, this blows my mind. They literally have a guy every once in a while go out into the middle of the runway and shoot fireworks. <laughs> the largest airport, busiest airport in the world, that's their that's their idea of what's going to fix it. That's the only thing they got. They'll shoot fireworks and try to scare them off. They have, they have uh, these audio things that send out signals to, to birds, and it's like, a, it's like a CD player or something, and it's the speaker that sends out these bird noises trying to get birds to go away. That's all they can do. <laughs> the most sophisticated airport in the world has a problem with birds. Can I tell you who doesn't have a problem with birds? God. God knows where every single one of them is. God controls them. God knows exactly where they are. Truly, we don't realize how dependent on the Lord we are. To think that God not only knows everything about all of creation, God knows you. He knows your circumstance. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows your heart. He knows your motives. He knows your location. The psalmist says, I go up into the, into the heavens. You're there. I lay my bed in Sheol. You're there. I can never escape the presence of the Lord. God sees all things, knows all things, understands all things, controls all things. Paul Washer said this, I used to tell young preachers, in order to preach, you've got to have the power of God on your life. Now I tell them, in order to tie your shoes, you've got to have the power of God on your life. Man, in order to do even the small, intricate tasks of life, how dependent on the Lord are we? Or are we fooled into thinking we've got some sort of control over this life? I think the story of Job... I think, in many ways, points us to this idea. Job could do the right thing. He could try to live for God. He could try to honor the Lord. He's a good man. It's what the Bible says in Job chapter 1. Trying to walk with the Lord. And at the end of the day, Job had no control over those circumstances that changed in his life. There is nothing that Job could have done to change any one of those circumstances. And yet God is still faithful, isn't he? God's still faithful. He's still patient with Job. Even in the midst of his trial, even in the midst of his circumstances. It reminds us of how dependent on the Lord we truly are. Because I, I don't know, I mean, many of you have probably experienced difficulty. And, and I know that at some point in time you experience suffering or pain or grief. Of various levels, we talked about that, how to be for friends in the middle of that, how to respond in the middle of that. But, but the truth of the matter is, when we look at Job's life, man, this is as bad as you could possibly imagine. He loses his cattle, he loses his family, he loses his health, he loses all of his, his wealth, and, and every bit of it is taken by, by neighboring enemies, and, and he's reduced down to owning nothing, to nothing. And Job says in chapter 1, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. At the end of the day, we might accumulate a lot of stuff in this world. But you will never actually own any of those things. You're a steward. God owns it. God owns the hills, he owns the cattle, he owns the house, he owns the car, he owns this church, amen? He owns those relationships that you have, family, friends, loved ones, children. He owns 
all the affairs of men and nations, and we cannot lose sight of the sovereignty of God. You and I are totally and completely dependent on a holy God. And you may question that. You may wonder about that. You may wonder why God made it that way. But that doesn't change the very nature of the existence of God. That's who he is. And he has created everything in this world, and it is up to him. It is up to him to decide what happens in this world. Now, we may question that on one hand, but then on the other hand, doesn't that bring you such peace? And knowing these things don't depend on you, the issues of this world, the, the, the things that happen in this world, the problems of this world, people try, to, people try to figure out the answer to world hunger as if we could fix that problem. <laughs> people try to figure out the answer to the issues of this world and try to, try to have global peace and stability and everything else, and we think it's a political answer and we just need diplomacy, or we think it's a military answer and we just need to go in and invade somewhere. Listen, these issues have happened throughout human history, and they will always happen until God calls us home. And so, Christian, we rest in this, knowing this. It's not up to us to fix the problems of this world. It's up to God. He's in control. It wasn't up to Job to fix his circumstances. It was up to the Lord. And only when the Lord intervened did those circumstances change. What is our response, though? What is our responsibility? What is it that we're supposed to do in the midst of our pain and difficulty? We can't fix it. We can't change it. And many of us, we wonder what what it is that we're supposed to do. There is something we do. We trust. We trust in the Lord. We obey his word. And what that involves is repentance. What that involves is turning away from the world and turning towards God on a daily basis. Listen, I believe when you're saved, you're saved until the Lord calls you home. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God is what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. There's nothing that could ever separate you from eternal life once you're saved. But man, for Christians that are growing in their faith, isn't repentance a daily occurrence that needs to happen in our lives? Day by day by day, trusting in the Lord more, following the Lord more, reading his word, being guided more by the word every single day, repenting from our sin because we do still sin. We do have temptation. How is it we respond? We repent and we trust in the Lord. And sometimes that involves recognizing and understanding, God, you are God and I am not. I am feeble finite, limited. I am temporary in this world. We have a beginning. We have an end. All of these things we have to recognize. I'm sinful. I fall short of your glory. I'm not perfect. And yet we trust in the one who is. One thing I love about Celebrate Recovery is the 12 steps are all biblically based. And step one of Celebrate Recovery is this. We admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors that our lives had become unmanageable. Boy, that's tough, ain't it? (laughs) We admitted we were powerless. Well, that's not what the world says. The world says you can do whatever you want. You just fix the problem. It's human ingenuity. It's the power and the answer is within you. Can I tell you, the answer is not within you or within me. The problem is within me. We admitted we were powerless of our addictions and compulsive behaviors that our lives have become unmanageable. And then they quote Romans 7, 18. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. This is what Job says. Job 42, excuse me. Yeah, Job 42, starting in verse 1. Job answered the Lord, 
I know that you can do everything. No purpose of yours can be withheld from me. He says in verse 3, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Now Job started off and it was a godly response in the midst of his trials. Lord gives, Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But his trials didn't end then. They were ramped up. They were long lasting. They were difficult. And I'm sure at some point Job felt like, Lord, when, when is this going to end? And there were questions. There were difficulties along the way. There were problems. There were moments in time where Job wondered what exactly God is doing about this. And Job had to get to this point where he acknowledged before a righteous and a holy God, I'm not God and you are. I've said things that I don't completely understand, things that are too great for me, which I just don't know about because of my human capacity, my limited understanding. You're the creator, I'm the creation, God. And Job poured out his heart to the Lord. From there, God can bring about restoration. And that's exactly what God did in Job's life. It didn't end there. God allowed Job to live a long life, to see his great, great grandchildren. Think about that. Man, think about the faithfulness of God. He lost his children, he lost so much of his possessions, he lost his health. And God allowed Job, after this point of contrition, God allowed Job to eventually see his great-great-grandchildren. What a blessing from a holy and a righteous God. God allowed Job to live a long life. He restored all that Job had lost and then some. And the same is true for us, church, that it's not in our strength that God gains glory or that God is glorified. Oftentimes it's in our weakness. It's in our low point. God's not asking for us, for some ability, for some sort of supernatural qualities that you have to offer, that you have to earn or you have to, you have to do in order to gain favor with a holy and a righteous God. He's already done what's necessary. God has already done all that is necessary for you and I to obtain eternal life. What God is asking from us is our obedience. God is asking for us to come to him in the midst of our weakness, even as children. I think one of the most beautiful illustrations of this is when children came to the Lord Jesus. And the disciples said, no, Jesus, he, he doesn't, Jesus doesn't have time for y'all. And what did Jesus say? Allow the children to come to me, for of such is the kingdom of God. Adults, sometimes we get too big for our britches. And we think we've we got things figured out. We know how to do this. We know how to do that. We can honor God with our lives and all this. Here's what God asks. Come to him as a little child who don't know nothing. Come to him as an obedient child, trusting and believing in him, because at the end of the day, he's in control of it all. Repentance brings about restoration. It's the same message that has existed since Job's time, the same message that exists today. Turn away from the things of this world and turn towards Jesus. And can I tell you, it is the most fulfilling place you can ever be when you're in the middle of God's will, when you're trusting in the Lord. When you lean on his understanding and not your own. We become frustrated. Things become difficult. We feel like we're spinning our wheels. We don't know what direction we're going in. When we try to do things on our own. But when we trust in the Lord, there is peace that passes all understanding. Would you do that? Would you pray with me today?